the Lord. God bless you. Let's be seated, everybody. God is good. Thank you, Charles. How is everyone doing? Yeah, 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 yeah. All righty. All righty. Hey, Chris, good to see you. Yeah, it's been a long time. I haven't seen you since Tuesday. Amen. Anyone excited about the insights and revelations that God's been bringing us lately? Come on. God is good. Yeah, yeah. I think Isabella is perhaps the most excited. Oh, yeah, yeah. Good to see you guys. I know one of you know me. One of you knows me from way back when. I don't know who just yet, but I'll be happy to meet you afterwards if you are able to wait. God is good. All righty, where's Tia? Where's Tia herself? She's in the coffee business. All righty, God is good. I hope she makes a cup for me as well. Hey, Sammy, good to see you too. It's been a minute. All righty. Chris, Isabella, and good to see you people. I know people that have been out of town for a while and we recognize having you back with us today. God is good. So today, uh, even Nicole and uh, my brother Jackson, they've been out of town too, doing their own thing. Yeah, awesome. They've been at a, a conference, so maybe one of these days they'll come and give us uh, some of their takeaways from the conference. It's not going to be awesome. God is good. You know, one of the things that is most amazing about life is if you can experience a transition for what it is, you become better positioned to be one of the beneficiaries of the purpose of transition. And I would explain that using a couple of examples. You know, when the world changes, some people don't make it through the change. You know, every time we've had a world war, every time we've had such a pestilence, things like that have the ability, or by design, they change many things. And that's why we say that the world is changing. But the people who do not experience it as a transition, you experience it as a termination, do not have the privilege of enjoying the new world. Let me say that again. When there is a plague, when there is a war, when there is something that is that devastating that things have no choice but to change, we experience those things differently. Some people will experience war as termination because they don't make it through. Whereas others experience war as a transition. And the ones who experience it for what it really is are the ones who better position or who are able to position themselves to be beneficiaries of such a prize. Hey. And that is the reason why every time there is war, wealthy people emerge after the war. Don't even look too far. Don't go to 1815. Don't go to 1794. Don't go too far. Just look back at 2020. <laughs> and we started to produce, or we have since then produced, not we, the world, has since produced the most number of billionaires ever. But some people are not with us today because that transition they experienced today as a termination. May their souls rest in peace, but the point and the objective of my concern today is we are yet in another transition. I was having a conversation with a friend of mine uh, who had heard about the prophetic word that I gave a couple of weeks ago, talking to us about the fact that there are three locations, principal locations of God's judgment According to Revelation chapter 7, there will be judgment upon the earth and the judgment upon the sea, as well as judgment upon the trees. Because the four angels that are in the corners of the earth holding the wind of God's judgment have been instructed to only wait until there is a confirmation of the seal of God's protection upon the saints. And once the seal is confirmed to God, they can release whatever is in their hands to release. And while I said that, I also mentioned maybe a week afterwards or a couple of days afterwards 
that it isn't, it isn't the judgment or the wind of destruction, as it is called, that will take certain people out. It is actually the transition between the land and the sea. And so he called me and he said to me, he said, when you said that, were you aware of the fact that tsunamis are a combination of the land and the sea? You know, when the wind blows upon the waters, we call it a hurricane. But when the earth itself opens up, where it meets with the ocean or underneath the ocean, what do we have? We have a tsunami. I said, the interesting thing, thank you, Charles, is that I wasn't consciously thinking of it, but the Lord showed to me that there will be a tsunami. And this is where it gets important. What happens in the natural is only meant to draw our attention to the things that are happening within. And so Jesus says, when you see these things, he didn't say fret, he didn't say panic. He says, when you see the earthquake, when you see the pestilence, when you see these things in the natural, what do you do? He says, lift up your eyes. And what is the object or the purpose of lifting up one's eyes? Come with me quickly to the book of John chapter 3. And Alan is going to be preaching with me today because I got a couple of scriptures that I would like, as it is your custom, to project onto the screen. John chapter 3. I am delighted to stand before you today as one who has heard. You know, the Bible says that a false witness is an abomination, but the one who hears, speaks as an oracle, he speaks expressly. To speak expressly means to speak as an oracle because the Holy Spirit of God, the Bible says, speaks expressly. And he who must speak on his behalf must speak also as an oracle expressly. John chapter 3, we're going to read verse 14, the Lord Jesus himself speaking. And what did he say? He says, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. You see, when I was coming in here today, the Lord revealed to me that there was a person in here and you are in the company of people that are about to be taken out by God because their time is up. You remain in their company and the word of the Lord says that the companionship of fools shall be destroyed. And I asked the Lord, how did this one find herself in such company? And the Lord said to me, look, she joined their race. Do you know that it is impossible for you to compete in this same boat to win the title from him without being on the field at the same time as he is. You can go set your own record somewhere else, but you, you wouldn't say that you beat him. And so in order for you to compete with people in a race, you have to be with them on the same field, even if you are on your own lane, but you still have to be where they're at. You have to be in the same vicinity as they are as they might be, and the Lord said to me, look at her, she went to join the race of fools. And what is this race of fools that she joined? You know that there are people who compare themselves to you. The Bible says those who compare themselves with themselves are what? They are fools. So every one of those people that you have committed yourself to impressing and outdoing, you are racing against. Because they are racing against you. The reason why they don't want you to succeed or the reason why they wish ill for you, the reason why they want your sins called out, the reason why they want to forget that your sins have been forgiven is because the, the worse you look, the better they feel about themselves. That is the definition of the race of fools. And the Bible says this woman has no business trying to do things to please them, trying to explain herself trying to justify her actions. It has become a distraction set up by the enemy to keep you from living your best life because your focus is no longer on fulfilling what God has called you to, but your focus is making sure that you look better than they expect you to do. It is not their, their expectation that matters as much as God's ordination of purpose over your life. And so when the Lord brought that vision to me, I want to say to you today, you know, if you are the person, stop and be calm. Stop looking around. Looking around is you trying to get even with the people that are already behind. When you get even with those who are behind, you are also behind. 
you need to look up to get ahead. John chapter 3, verse 14, the Bible says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And John 3, 16 is the one we all know. What is Jesus telling us here? Jesus says the purpose of looking up is for the salvation of the soul. When you see these things, look up. Why do we look up? We look up because whosoever looks up gets saved. Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. That's why the Bible says, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. So when we see these things in the natural, our focus should not be on the things that we see and what men make of it. Our focus will be to then allow the awakening that God has instructed and commissioned to be fulfilled. So going back to the tsunami, and going back to why it is critical to know what happens at the transition between the land and the sea. I told you that the judgment that is coming upon the land, the wind will look like natural disasters, like earthquakes, and like what? And like floods. I said that, and about two days after I said it, Morocco had, a, had an earthquake. And they, they don't have earthquakes. Most places in Africa don't have earthquakes. They had an earthquake. And then Libya got flooded. Now, how can you flood a city or a nation that is in the desert? Unless there's a boisterous wind that brought the water from somewhere far away. You see, these things have started in the natural. There will be several iterations of them because of the mercy of God. Because of the mercy of God, there will be several. There have been some and there will be more so that you can continually be awakened on your inside. Now, people say things like, well, Brother Moses, since the 70s, people have been teaching and preaching that the world is about to end. So why is it different this time? What is the assurance that we have? Can we not focus on other things because this world doesn't seem like it's about to end? The reality of it is the world ends and begins multiple times over. There are always transitions that change the face of the world and your world. And that is the reason why it is good for us to live constantly with the mentality of transition because if we don't, it could become something else to us. The ground will shake, the oceans will roar. And what that means to you and I is that we must not be caught waiting in the wrong place. And I'm going to explain that a little further in just a moment. But before I go ahead, there is a picture that the Lord will have me paint to you because it affects many people in the body of Christ in the times that we are in. And that is many of us, we have been, or we become obsessed with doing that we are no longer thinking. Many of us are caught in the rat race of life, always just doing, 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 doing not taking time to actually have thoughts and expose our thoughts to the Almighty God. I saw a house with cobwebs all over. And when I asked what are these cobwebs, I was told that the room that I was looking at represents the minds of many people who are named by the name of God, but they have used less and less of that room and cobwebs are taking it home because they're just so occupied. The one person that I saw in particular had a beautiful garment that was hung up but was wearing rags. And her attention was focused on a tin can that is open and boiling. The moment I saw the garment, of course, I knew what it represents. It represents putting away the righteousness of God that you have in Christ Jesus to see yourself that the way the world sees you. The world sees us as wretched. 
the world sees us as folks that can be taken advantage, advantage of and that should be taken advantage. When you think about it, the way the world system is built and designed is such that you are supposed to be a slave within it. Serving with the best of what you have, the world system. I don't care whether you're a billionaire or millionaire or the king of, or, of some nation. You find that most people are a slave to some idea of wealth. And so this person is sitting there in rags and holding a can that is oily. I asked, I said, what is this oily job? They said, she found it. It wasn't given to her to open. She found it. She picked it from the dung heap. So this person is literally eating that which has been thrown away. We're going to pray in just a moment. And that is the reason why I've asked you to just minister along with me through this session because of the fact that the Lord once again wants your thoughts awakened for you to think. You know, the Bible says that we live, we prosper, and we're in health only to the extent that our souls prosper. Third John 2, at least above all things, that you may prosper and be in health as your soul prospers. On Tuesday, might have been Saturday last week, what did that tell you? The soul of man represents. The soul of man represents the assembly of his collective thoughts and consciousness. So your soul can be collectively focused on the things of the spirit that gives you the consciousness of who you are in Christ Jesus, or your soul can be totally focused on your emotions and the weakness that you have in the flesh that makes you feel the need to struggle all the time, where, whereas, in fact, you have been set free. And so if everything rests on your soul, and your soul is the assembly or the totality of your thoughts, should you not take time to think the right thoughts? To think the right thoughts. To allow for yourself to, to enjoy and to, and to be present in the goodness of God in your thinking. You know, most people don't teach you to think. They only teach you to do. Because if I can get you to not think and do, you will do what I think. Because actions have to be guided by thoughts. And so if, if not your thoughts, then the thoughts of somebody else. And these are the things that have actually relegated us as believers, as the called out ones, the ecclesia. We've been relegated to the back seat of prominence and relevance simply because we have been told to not think but to just do. Religion constitutes a set of dogmas which are things that you are told to do. Don't ask questions. Just do it. I told you before, the biggest enemy of the body of Christ is religion. It's the greatest attack of the enemy. When we just do things religiously. And God told the children of Israel, even after having given them laws, even after having set things in place to guide their actions, he still invited them to a meeting. He says, come and let us reason together. Even though your sins are as red as crimson, they can be white as snow. God is saying we can resolve everything by just having this deliberation of thought. Let, he didn't say, come and let us just talk. He says, come, let us think together. This is still along the lines of what I shared with you, that many of us are in the same book with the Lord Jesus, but you are not on the same page as the Lord Jesus. You are in the same book, meaning your life has been written out by God, like the life of Jesus was written in the volume of the books, whereas you are not on the same page as the Lord because you're not thinking alongside with him, simply because you're not even thinking at all. So the cobwebs have to go. You need to start to use that room again. And to use that room again means to be able to walk in the majesty of the privileges that you have as a born-again child of God, a new creation in Christ Jesus. Everything begins with the thought that you have in your heart. The Bible says it is with the heart that the man believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. We need to be able to think right because what we think ends up being what we believe. I know that many of us think that what we believe is what we think. No, but it is what you think 
that you end up with. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you because the entrance of your word brings light and understanding unto the sinful. As your word has come forth today, as light to illuminate hearts, Father, in Jesus' name, may we be able to get up and go in accordance with your word. Not my will, but yours be done. Let's read a verse of scripture very quickly, and then we're going to pray about the resuscitation of the heart. And the resuscitation of the thoughts, you know, because your thoughts are like impulses. Sometimes when you have not used them for a while, the gap between the beating of your thoughts become too wide to sustain your life. It needs to be close. It needs to be beating. Your impulse of thought has to constantly be going up and down. Not going up and down in confusion, but going up to God in faith and confidence and coming down in humility of heart to be able to receive with meekness the implanted word of God that is able to save your soul. You see, these impulses have to be close enough to be able to sustain your life. And that resuscitation is about to take place in here for many in the mighty name of Jesus. Isaiah chapter 57. I want you to say, I don't know, you see, some of the things that I have said, I have said concerning all of us in this room. But specifically, somebody on this side of the room needs to tell herself, I am not who I was. You see, be thinking about it, but I'm going to talk to everybody. The Bible says, who the Son sets free is free indeed. Who we were in the system, the Bible says that we were slaves to sin. But we were not left there to perish with the world. We were given an opportunity to look at the one that was lifted up. And having looked at the one that was lifted up, we have received salvation. So are we still that old man, that old being? No, not anymore. We're a new creation in Christ Jesus. But many of us are not thinking like new creation, and that is the reason why we're not speaking as new beings. So you need to tell yourself, I am not who I was. It's going to make sense to you in a minute. More sense, I believe. Isaiah chapter 57. And we're going to read verses 11 through 13. It says, and of whom have you been afraid of fear that you have loved and not remembered me, not taking it to your heart? Is it not because I have held my peace from all that you do not fear me? The Lord God Almighty is saying, who exactly are you afraid? What is making you tell a lie? He said, and you have not remembered me, nor taken it to your heart. Many of us will have good Bibles that would actually put the word it in italics. So it's, it's oblique, which means it was inserted by the people who translated the Bible into English so that it can make sense to them. So every time you see a word in italics like that, it means it was not there in the original text, but when they translated it into English, they're like, ah, this doesn't make sense. We're just going to put this here. But we want everybody to know that we put it. Can you see it in italics in your Bible? Who has a good Bible here? Josephine? Anybody else? Yeah, so that's what the, one of those words. Every time you see it in italics, that means it was inserted just as a suggestion for clarity. Now, I want you to read it without the it. What is the Lord saying? The Lord says, you have not remembered me, nor taken to your heart. Not it. The Lord is talking about himself. He says, you have not remembered me. Neither have you brought me into your thoughts. <laughs> you see, many of us, don't bring God into our thoughts. You're thinking about how you're going to solve that problem. But is God in that thought? 
And when I say that we have cobwebs in the room because we're not thinking, a lot of what many of us think is thinking, or many of us have concluded that we think and have thoughts, whereas the reality of it is you do not have thoughts. What you have are copies of other people's thoughts. Which means you are trying to solve these problems and attend to these issues using other people's methods and what they have said. So the room still has cobwebs because what you do is you step out with your little rag, rag, rag dress that you're putting on and the garbage can that you picked up with grease all over it and then you go to someone else's room who has actually thoughts. And they're like, wow, this room looks nice. And then you come out of that into yours and it's still the same. Nothing has changed simply because you have not brought the Lord into your own heart because you have not created the room for him to come in. All borrowed thoughts have to be decommissioned. All of the unique thoughts that God has for you as a whole as an individual expression of himself, they need to be activated. You know, the Bible says that we are a royal priesthood and the people of peculiarities. We are all unique before the Lord. And that's why the word of God says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your own mind. That you may prove that which is good, that which is acceptable and perfect will of God. But it has to be in your own mind. You need to originate your own thoughts from the thoughts of God himself. We have been limited far too long because we're living our lives based on other people's interpretation of what our father said. He's not just their father. When Jesus refers to God as his father, he would say to his disciples, my father and yours. Just so that you don't walk around with a borrowed revelation. These cobwebs have to go. You need to revive your own heart for meditation and for creating room for God to be in your thoughts. For his power to be present in your thoughts. Let's keep over verse 12 for time's sake. Verse 13 says, when you cry out, let your collection of idols deliver you. But when the wind, but, but the wind will carry them all away and the, the breath will take them, but he who puts his trust in me shall possess the land and shall inherit my holy mountains. This is what I started by saying, so now let us revisit it again. I'm going to read this one more time, and then we're going to revisit what I was saying about the transition between the land and the sea and the wind that is coming. I told us a couple of days ago that the reason why the wind is coming is not to destroy you, but is to remove the wicked from the land. Because the wicked have to be removed first before you are gathered into the barn. For the sake of those who are not here, I reminded everybody that we grew up thinking that we would, that all we're doing is waiting for Jesus to come and rescue us from this mess. Right? A lot of us are thinking of the rapture is an escape strategy. Because the world is so bad, it's so broken, and it's so corrupt, and it's perishing that God cannot do anything about it other than to come and save his children and say, let's get out of here and just leave it for the wicked. Maybe one day we'll set it on fire. But the reality of it is that is not what the word of God says. You will not find that understanding in the word of God. This was concocted in the palaces of certain kings to keep us subdued. The word of God says, Jesus speaking, he says the wheat were planted in the field. And then later the enemy came and he sowed tears. And the, and, the, and the servants of the owner of the land said, oh, let us quickly go and remove the tears. And Jesus says, no, 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 no. It's not a work for men. Men do not have the skill. It's like you are wheat, you are planted. You are not the one to remove the tears planted next to you. It is not the work of men to do. So he says, you don't worry about the wheat because the wheat represents good people. Good people are not to uproot bad people. That is the work of the angels of the Lord. He says, my father will send angels. The reapers will come into the field and they will first of all remove the tears from the field. 
and they will burn them in the fire. Which is the prophecy of Enoch. When Enoch started his writing in Enoch chapter 1 verse 9, what did he say? He says this all will happen that the wicked may be removed from the earth and the pompous things they have said will be forgotten. All of the boastings that men are making. Oh, that will stop us from doing this. Oh, they're going to plan this. They're going to do that. Oh, vision 2030. And all of that stuff. They're speaking pompous things because the Bible says, who is he that says a thing that it comes to pass when the Almighty has not uttered it? I tell you what, folks, all of these things are happening so that the wicked can be removed from the earth and God has done it again and again. In the time of Noah, it didn't take Noah from the earth so that the wicked can inherit the earth. It took Noah up into the ark so that the wicked can be removed from the face of the earth. And all of the wicked were removed and Noah inherited the earth himself and his children. Matthew chapter 5 verse 5, Jesus says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. The wind of destruction that is coming, the Bible says it will come after a seal has been placed upon the saints of the Lord, the ecclesia, so that when the destruction comes, they will remain afterwards to inherit the earth. And the Bible says, then we shall be caught up to meet with him in the air, and we will come down with the saints with the new bodies that are eternal, so that we can then enjoy his reign. Look at what the Lord is saying here to his people. He's saying, you have been living your life without me in your thoughts. And everything you do is what somebody else tells you to do. You have elevated men and their methods. You have elevated politicians, pastors, and celebrities to take my place in your thoughts. I am not in your thoughts. Their ideologies are in your thoughts. Their words are in your thoughts. And when somebody takes the place of God, what do they become to you? They become an idol. And that is why in verse 13 it says, when you cry out, let, the, let your collection of idols deliver you. He says, when that time comes, those of you who have not put me in your thoughts, who are not receiving instructions from me of what to do with the day of famine and trouble, those idols, let me see them save you. They will come and tell you that there is a lion on the streets. They will scare you that there is another pandemic, that there is another disease, that there is another plague, so that you can run to them for salvation. They will tell you, we'll put this in your body to save you. They are idols. They can save not themselves. How can they save you? The Lord says, let me see them deliver you on that day. He says, but the wind, what wind are we talking about? The wind of Revelation chapter 7. He says the wind will come and carry them away. The purpose of God for the wind of change that is coming upon the earth is not to weaken your knees. It's not to eradicate you even further. It is to remove the wicked so that for a change you can breathe in the land of the living. But the wicked are like the troubled sea. Oh, sorry, that's verse 20. Verse 13. But he who puts his trust in me shall possess the land. The ones who are the beneficiaries of transition are the ones that will enjoy the land. The ones who are the beneficiaries. To be a beneficiary of a thing is to receive all the privileges therein. That's what it means. And so the privileges of being on earth to inherit it, to make it your own, to do all of what your heavenly father has put in your heart to do, to turn this place once again into that garden of Eden. All of those things are the things of your privilege that makes you a beneficiary. But you have to fulfill one condition. He says, those who put their trust in me shall possess the land. To trust the Lord in the season that we're in is to recognize that he and his angels are the ones at work. You know, I've been saying this thing for about two years. Jude says, do not speak evil of dignitaries. He says, do not speak evil of anyone, especially dignitaries or dignitaries. He says, because even Saint, even Angel Michael, the Archangel Michael, before I tell you that story, 
Let me tell you what I mean by do not speak evil of dignitaries. The Lord took me in the spirit of several occasions between 2020 and 2022, a lot of it in 2021, and he will show me the behind the curtain of what is happening politically. And some of these politicians are not even there. Some of the actors on the world stage today, they are not men. A lot of them who lie very freely. That you see them, they just come on television and they lie to everybody. They are not men. They are angels. Someone is like, okay, can you show me that in the Bible? Remember the council of Haithophel. When Absalom, I believe it was Absalom, one of David's sons, when he wanted to overthrow his father, he had a very clever man on his team. And Haithophel was so spot on because Haithophel was actually a seer. He wasn't a prophet, but he was a seer. He was gifted by God to see things. You know, we know so many seers in the world today who are using their gift just to amass wealth for themselves because they can see the future. They see how things should come together. Aitofu was one of those people. He was a seer. He was operating by the gift of God. And the Bible says that the gifts and the callings of God, they are without repentance. When God, once God gives you the gift, he doesn't bring you back. And so they couldn't take the gift from Aitofu because he was already a gift. It's given. It's only people who give you something and they come to take you back. I only give that to you, man, the leader, because I thought we were friends. But now you just posted that Rosemary is your best friend. So what am I? Give me back my earrings. You know, we do things like that. We buy tickets for our children to go on holiday. And because they annoy us, we wake up and like, you see that trip to the Bahamas is now canceled. I take back my little tickets. That's what we do as people. But when God gives, he gives. That's it. And so rather than take the gift from him and violate divine principle, God raised somebody with a gift that could address that problem. The Bible says that God was watching from heaven and he saw the that the life of his beloved was at stake. He saw that Absalom was closing in. And when you are the Lord's beloved, which means you are the one who puts your trust in the Lord. God will go all out for you. He will shut everything down for your sake. It doesn't matter what the other angels were saying, their concerns about what was going on everywhere else in the world. God was like, at this particular point in time, all I care about is my beloved. David, the beloved of God. And you see, I tell you, the secret to having God's attention is easy. It's very simple. To have God's attention, you've got your attention. The reason why the eye of the Lord was stayed on David was because David's heart was stayed on the Lord. When you have thoughts that are genuine to you, your own original thoughts, and you invite God into those thoughts, he will come in with you and you with him. Revelations 3.20. Now, is he coming together for you? Because I'm telling, I'm bringing to you from the last three, four messages. Because, you know, I told you that Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, that if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come and dine with him and then he with me. So the first thing is Jesus comes to your house, he eats with you, and then after that, you will then go to his house to eat with him. That's what it means. Many of us only stop at having Jesus come into our hearts. And when he comes to your heart, because he's nice, he's kind, he just comes in and just takes you as you are. But when you have to come into his own house, you have to be holy. <laughs> you cannot just show up you cannot arise and just say oh, I've had enough of this place I'm going to Jesus' house <laughs> the Bible says who is it that will ascend only the ones with a pure heart Father in the mighty name of Jesus we thank you because we have life by your Holy Spirit by your word that is spirit and word. We have come to such a time wherein we need to see as God sees. Let me say this again. Somebody needs to hear it one more time. Somebody needs to hear what I just said about the fact that you need to, first of all, let Jesus come into your heart. And then he will bring you into his own heart. So let him come into your thoughts. Tell Jesus, Okay, so I'm done praying because I see many people's heads are still bowed. Oh, are you asleep? 
All righty. So let's let's look up for a moment. I should have said something. Sorry. Let's let's look up for a moment. Because I know when I started praying, I know some of y'all just tapped into it. Praise God. That was good. Awesome. But when it comes into your heart, what it means is you say, Jesus, these are the things that I am praying. I think I can do this. I think I should do that. Even though the world is saying this, but this is what I understand from your word. This is what I picked up from your Holy Spirit's instruction that I should be doing. And Jesus will look at it and say, okay, I see where this is coming from. But now are you ready to come to my thoughts? And that is where you want to be. You want to come into his thoughts. You know why? Because in his thoughts, everything is possible. <laughs> the Bible says that in him is light and there is no shadow. So when you are in his thoughts, everything is clear. You suddenly know how to talk to your wife better. You know how to address situations better because you are clear. The reason why we yell sometimes is because we're not clear. The reason why we're frustrated and we feel like there is a knot in our stomach and we keep walking around and just looking like, you know, is because we're not clear. But once you are clear, and there are peace. What you have is what you give. If you find somebody giving trouble, they are troubled. But if you have peace, you will give peace. Speak no evil of dignitaries. The Lord showed to me that some of these people were like the angel of the Lord that addressed the issue of Absalom. So Absalom was David's son, for those people who have not read the Bible recently. And he wanted to take over his father's throne forcefully. Right? Even though God was ready for a transition, which is an interesting thing because it's very similar to what we're going through. When God was dealing with David, David was a man of war. David was such a violent man that he wanted to build God a temple. And God looked at his hands and was like, with all that blood in your hands, no, thank you. Simply because there's only one blood that he wanted in his temple, and that is the blood of the Lamb. And so he was like, I don't want none of that blood. And David was like, but I have, I have taken treasures from the nations. I have shield of gold as far as the eyes can see. I have what it takes to build you a temple. And God was like, but I appreciate you. But no, thank you. Because the things that God wants to do for you, he wants to do it while you are at rest. So that you cannot come around and take the glory. And so God already saw that David had a son whose life and essence was conducive for God's intervention and for God to build. And the guy's name was Solomon. Solomon means a peaceful man. Solomon is from Shalom, a peaceful man. He was a man of peace. And so when you're a man of peace, you rest, and then God does the work so that you can enjoy the benefits, but he takes all the glory. Absalom, on the, other, on the other hand, was not that kind of a man. He wanted to do it by his own power. He wanted to do it forcefully by his own power. He wasn't living up to the name that he was named because he was named by the name of God, but he wouldn't live up to his name. He wanted to live up to his own abilities. And God was like, that's not what we're doing today. We've seen that with David and for 40 years. I've had enough. I want some peace. I want Solomon. And so what did Absalom do? He wanted to overrun David. And he had a man whose counsel was always spot on. You see, when the Lord started to teach me about the counsel of Ahithophel, one of the things that he did was he showed me a table. And the table had the entire kingdom laid out. And Absalom was given a pair of eyes with which he could see harder than everybody else. He saw a broader horizon than everybody. And that's the reason why he could have pinpointed. He was able to pinpoint where David was going. And that's because of the perspective that he had. He was a seer. So what happened was, God was like, okay, we need to fix this problem. So what did he do? The Bible says, a lying spirit was summoned to stand before the Lord. And the Lord was like, I've been waiting to use you for a while. Because the Bible says all things were made by him for him. Even the lying spirit was not made by Satan. Ooh. Someone is like, is that how God operates? Well, the reality of it is we call him God because he is God. He is the maker of all things. 
the serpent that deceived Adam and Eve was made by God. The Bible says that the serpent was the most cunning of all of God's creation in the God. That's the reason why we just need to trust him. Because he is the cause and the effect, the author and the finish, and the beginning and the end. There is nothing that was made that was made without the word. And so whenever you think that something is happening to you and it's from the devil, stop giving credit to the devil. Tell God, God, this one that you have brought is a little weird, but what are you trying to do? Because I didn't sign up for being broke, so what are you trying to do? You tell God, God, this is not what I was expecting. I was expecting for this thing to go smoothly. What are you trying to do? I thought I was going to have a fine day to drive this convertible around town, but now it's about to rain. What are you trying to do? And the Lord will whisper to you with that still small voice, and say that convertibles are supposed to be driven by people who have opened themselves up to receive the word of God, but you've been busy chasing money, now you've made money, you want to chase pleasure. It's raining today, so you can sit your behind down and let me talk to you. But many of us, when you see the rain, you start to bind the devil. God gave me this convertible so that I can enjoy summer rain at Lana. I bind the devil. And the devil is like, when you're done, let me know. Because that ain't me. And God will also say the same thing. When you're done, let me know. Because that is me. Anyway, the lying spirit, the Bible says, departed from the presence of the Lord with a very clear instruction. God said to the lying spirit, because God has spirits that he doesn't use all the time, forces. He says, even the wicked, I am the one preparing with the wicked for the day of doom. Because if there's no wicked, who will be destroyed? That was what God says. He says, I prepare the wicked for the day of destruction. If there was no Judas, that means it might have been John who would betray Jesus. And poor John, I don't think he would it would be easy on himself. The Bible says there was a son of perdition that had already been prepared. Now, this is the question most people ask. Most people say, oh, so God can just make wicked people and bad people. So what if he makes me a wicked person? What choices do I have? No, God is an author. He writes plays. He will write the script. He will write the law. It is yours to audition for which one you want. <laughs> the Bible calls him an author. The Bible says he is the author. J.K. Rowling, who wrote Harry Potter, was not the one who recruited people for it. People came to audition and said, I want to play the part of the beast. Every play, every time someone goes to audition for a play, they choose what they want to audition for. You don't want to audition for the princess. You don't want to audition for the hero. You don't want to audition for the one that risks his life for his friends. You want to audition for the drug dealer. Okay, well, you've got the role. Because somebody's got to do it. So when God writes his place, how do I know that? The Bible says that God is no respecter of persons. He just creates roles. Because he says, this is my world. This is the way that I want it to run. There will be a deceiver. There will be a receiver. There will be this. There will be that. You choose which one you want. And that is the reason why he said to the children of Israel, I was set before you today in life and death. Choose life that you may live. Choose. Are you going to be light or are you going to be darkness? Are you going to be an example to believers or are you going to be a reflection of the world? You choose this day whom you shall serve. The Lord or Belial. So the lying spirit at some point in eternity made his choice that he was going to play that role. Just like Satan made his choice that he was going to be a deceiver. He chose to abandon his position. And so, story for another day, the lying spirit left. And the Bible says the lying spirit went and he took over the other counselors that were around Hytaku. And then he convinced them. You see, those guys were in awe of Hytaku. Whatever Aitofu said was what they all repeated. They were like consultants in the marketplace. A lot of consultants have no ideas of their own. They're just like, in fact, according to this particular standard, this is what we're going to do. So those people did whatever Aitofu said. So in order for them to be convinced not to follow Aitofu's counsel, he had to take a higher power. So the deceiver came, the lying spirit came, possessed them, and they defeated the council of Aitofu. Why am I telling you all of that? 
there are people in the news, especially since 2020, who are operating under the same spirit that is called the lion spirit. There are reapers amongst us. You know, I tell people, open your eyes. Think about it. When this life that we're living becomes written down as scriptures, will it be different from the Old and the New Testament? No. In the Old and the New Testament, people's names and the names of places, they represent what those things mean, or at least they tell you a message, they give you a hint. So when 2020 came, what did I tell you? I told you, I said, the reapers have come into the field to separate the wheat from the tears. We will now know the people who will trust God with their lives or the people that will trust witchcraft. I said, we're about to know. It's 2020. It's about to be separated. And one of the people that was the champion of 2020, his name literally means reaper. Go and look at the meaning of out, then you thank me later. The word Fauci means the one with a sickle. A sickle is a tool that is used for harvest. And it is used for cutting things down. And the Lord says, I am here to cut down the wicked and by weakness I've been refused. I tell you that so that you will not fall for the trap of the enemy by speaking against people in public places, in public offices. It doesn't matter whether they are the leader of the opposing political party. Do not utter a word against them. I know it's a hard saying because some of these people, you hate them with a perfect hatred. But the reality of it is that are you going to choose the role of one who hates or the role of one who loves? What did you tell us? See, the reason why I'm addressing this issue is because it's one of the things, like I told you at the beginning, I said I'm going to explain myself with some examples. Examples are good because it helps to drive home the point. When the Lord showed me that many of us are homes or our thought spaces have become full of cobwebs is because we're not even thinking about what's going on politically ourselves. We are following the crowd. We're using other people's thoughts because we have allowed celebrities and political figures to be idols in our lives. Don't worry, some of those people are about to be just pack their bags and go back to their positions where they came from. I tell you that because very soon they will just disappear. You will start asking yourself, where is this person? I haven't heard of them lately. Because a wind is coming that will remove him. Jude told us a story. He said, when the archangel of the Lord Michael, Michael was the one that drove Satan out of heaven with the thought of the angels. Michael is not a small boy. He's a very powerful angel, the most powerful archangel that we know of. He said, when Michael was asked by God to retrieve the body of Moses, now again for the person that got born again two weeks ago, you may not have read this, but when Moses died, God was the one who hid his body. The Bible says God asked Moses to come to the month of Nebo, the month of sea, the, the mount of sight, because God wanted to show him the promised land. So God took him to the month of Nebo and he said, look, this is, this is everything. I'm going, to do, I'm going to finish what I started. Thank you for the part that you have played. Now you're tired. The reason why God retired Moses was not because God was angry with Moses and God was frustrated or irritated. No, God knew that Moses was such a meek man. By God's own words, God described Moses as the meekest man on earth. That's the way, the way God refers to David as the man after my own heart. He called, he called Abraham his friend. What does he call Moses? He says, this one is the meekest man. I am God. My eye runs to and fro upon the earth. I see everybody. Nothing is hid from me. This is the meekest man on earth. And for the meekest man to be so frustrated that he struck the rock twice, God was right. He stopped. Because when you're tired, you get cranky. And God was like, how do we fix tiredness? Rest. He says, come unto me, all of you who are labored and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. When God came, God was like, come to the month of Nebo. We have a meeting. He was like, Moses, you're tired. I know you love these people, but come on. You're the meekest man on the earth. What was that about? It's an indication that you are tired. You need to resign right now. I will accept the resignation. Because you need rest. And Moses did not debate with God. 
In fact, if anything at all, he said, I ascribe greatness to our Lord the Rock. That was one of the very last things he wrote down. His word is perfect and all his ways are just. People have always debated and wondered how did people get their hands on Deuteronomy 30? How did they get their hands on it? Because Moses was supposed to have been taken up to the mountain of Nebo. It's because the man wanted to leave a record somewhere for people to see and know exactly that. Don't judge God. Don't think that God is evil because he took me away. His ways are just. I'm getting ready by the grace of God, hopefully, to put this thing together so we can pray and then be out of here. But Moses' body was hid by God because Moses had stopped being mortal in his body. Remember that he had spent so much time with God that all the darkness within him had been driven out and his eyes began to glow. He received a countenance or a transfigured countenance that after a while he had to cover his face with a veil in order for people to be able to stand in his presence. And so Satan must have been waiting. Oh, one day, this man will be retired. I need that body. Because if Satan had been able to lay his hand on the body of Moses, he would have made an idol out of it. People would have been worshipping that body till today. Are people still worshipping bodies that became immortal? There are wars in this country and beyond. Not in, they didn't fight it in this country. They fought it from this country. But there are wars that have been fought of late when millions and hundreds of thousands of people have died simply because there are certain bodies that wanted to be retrieved from certain places. People don't know that Adam, when Adam died, his body refused to decompose. His children carried his body around for centuries because his body failed to decompose. Moses' body would not decompose. So God knew that at some point, these miscreants will find it. So he sent Michael to come and retrieve the body of Moses. And according to the book of Jude, Jude is only one chapter, so you may want to even read it in the, when you get home tonight. Jude said when Moses came, when Michael came to retrieve the body of Moses, Satan accosted him. And Satan said, Dude, we were together in heaven, you drove me out. Now I've come to the earth and I'm kind of like a local champion. This is my terrain. You cannot take this body from here. I tell you that many of us would have said to Satan, how dare you? We would have sworn and cursed and said all kinds of things. Do you not know who I am? Did you forget how I dealt a blow against you the other day? The Bible says Michael in a bid not to speak evil of Satan. He did not revive Satan. What did he do? He said, what the Bible says, yet Michael, the archangel, in contending with the devil when he disputed about the body of Moses, did not to bring against him a reviling accusation, but said, the Lord. Do you know the significance of saying the Lord? Rebuke me. Is that it is not you that should rebuke them. If you have a problem with a politician, ask the Lord to rebuke them. If you have a problem with anybody, ask the Lord to rebuke them. Job and his friends, they rebuked each other for like maybe four weeks. Back and forth and there was no solution. Until one day, Job had a revelation. He says, by arguing, we have proven nothing. He says, show each of us where we have gone wrong. And each one of them was made to realize where they have gone wrong and they became friends again and Job become prosperous once again. You see, we are too busy taking everything into our hands as though we are gods. Whereas in fact, we are subjects of the almighty God who are supposed to allow him into our thoughts and allow his thoughts to guide our actions and his thoughts are clearly written down. The companionship of fools shall be destroyed. It is my mandate by the Lord today, my mission by the Lord today is to help us in the transition that we are in. The world is changing yet again. One world is going and another is coming in its place. And this, these wings have been sent by God to remove the wicked from the earth. And if you are not careful, I'm just going to say it the way that it really is. Don't, don't let yourself be removed together with them. 
let this transition benefit you. Let it not be your termination. And I pray that in the mighty name of Jesus that we will not be lost with the wicked. Because we will put our trust in the Lord. I trust the Lord to rebuke that politician. I will not. I trust the Lord to open that person's eyes so I will not judge them. I will not condemn them. I will not speak evil of them because these men who are strange amongst us, some of them are angels. That's why the Bible says, be kind to strangers because by so doing, some have unwittingly entertained angels. So these are some of the traps of the enemy and we cannot fall for them. Let us go ahead and break bread and then we're going to pray. So breaking bread today, we're just going to examine once again, Romans chapter 1, verse 9. And I'm going to, this Romans chapter 1, verse 9 is yet another proof that the earth will be inherited by the righteous and that the wicked will be removed from the earth. The Bible says in Romans chapter 1, verse 9, for God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son, that without ceasing, I make mention of you always in my prayers, making requests if by some means, now at least I may find a way in the will of God to come to you. Verse 9 is exactly where I'm going. It says, if we can go back to verse 9, it says, For God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit and the gospel of his son, that without season I make mention of you always in my prayers. I want us to learn to make mention of people and things to God in our prayers. Don't discuss people with other people because that's how you will come out of us, those I mean, of such conversations with their opinion instead of God's opinion. Make mention of things in your prayers to the Lord because the reapers are human. They look like men, but they are not men. Some of these are deadly angels that have been prepared by God since the beginning of the world for such a time as this. And they would do so many devious things that you would not even want to believe that they ever came by God. Some of God's most present angels in the affairs of life are actually angels that you and I would not approve. An example is the angel of death. But without the angel of death, do you think Pharaoh would have let them go? No, but the Bible says, I am the angel of the Lord. Semicolon, the angel of death. Praise the Lord. So I encourage you today, don't continue to see as men see. Let no celebrity or let nobody be too important to you such that you will elevate them above God because people will say, oh, this was what this person said and I believe them. So because of that, I'm going to take this stand against that other person. Don't let anyone incite you onto evil. Make mention, whatever it is that is not connected to you, make mention to the Lord and let him die to you. So as we receive the Lord's body today and drink of his blood in remembrance of him, I want to encourage us as much as possible to say before the Lord today, Lord, my trust is in you. My trust is in you. Jesus gave his body and his blood to the ones who put their trust in him. He told the 4,000, oh, you have to eat of my body and drink of my blood. And they were like, nope. But then the 12 stayed and they said, we have left all to follow you. But there was one of them who didn't leave all, was still holding on to money. And that was Judas. And Judas did not partake fully of the Lord's body because immediately he took his cup he went away. So I tell you what, folks, may you and I find it within us to truly surrender to the Lord. And as we pray today, in fact, let's quickly break bread and then we're going to address the issue of the cobwebs real quick. Let's break bread. Jesus said, as often as we have the opportunity, do this in remembrance of me. He took the bread and he says, this is my body broken for you. He took the wine and he says, this is my blood poured out for you. As often as you do this, as often as you can, do this in remembrance of me. You may eat and drink in Jesus' name.
Praise the Lord. So the reason why I asked Bennett to stay is because the Lord said to me that there is a new sound in this place today. A new sound. And that sound has already gone forth and it's going to do a new thing in your life. In the mighty name of Jesus. But this is the only prayer, or at least the main prayer that I'm going to say to address the cobwebs. And it's going to be a prayer of humility. That you will be humble enough to allow the word of God to take the place of your own thoughts and the thoughts of other people. That you will leave here today with a renewed dedication to the word of God. That you yourself will search the scriptures and find out for yourself what the Lord says about every single thing that you're involved with. You don't have to do it all in one day, but when you're faced with any situation and people at work are judging and condemning a group of people, go back to scriptures and find for yourself, what does the word of God say? These thoughts will now become my thoughts. And I'm going to put my trust in him and in him alone. Not in the news, not in the stock market, not in my own little circle of, of, of political activists. No, only in what the Lord says, because that wind is coming to remove the wicked, and I am not one of them. In the mighty name of Jesus. Still see that while we're at, I want us to be in an attitude of prayer. And just say something to the Lord today. The Bible says we believe in, in with our hearts and we confess with our mouths. Let us just repent and confess, or confess and then repent. You see, let's say it with our mouth and say, Lord, I know exactly what your servant is saying today. This message, I know exactly how it affects me. The ideologies and the idols. I deny them it today to embrace you afresh. From here onward, my trust will be in you and my thoughts will be of you and you will be in my thoughts and I will be in yours. I'm not going to be quick to judge, I am not going to be quick to condemn. And this mouth that has spoken against that politician, this mouth that has condemned that gospel artist, this mouth that has condemned that secular artist, I will not use the mouth to do the same again. But going forward, I will just mention them to you in other ways. Like the Archangel Michael says the Lord to you, I will mention your name in conversations. I will let you address issues so that I can truly be at peace like Solomon, so that I can be at rest, not agitated by different standards of men, but at peace with the holy standard of your word. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, I thank you. I pray for you that in the mighty name of Jesus, that some of us who are standing here today, the things that the Lord has said to us while the message was going on, some of the things that he has whispered into your heart as the message was going on that you have no full understanding of, I pray that he will give you dreams. And in those dreams, you will better understand what he is saying. I said certain things here a couple of weeks ago and Alan texted me today. He said, I had a dream. And in the dream, he said, I saw you and you said to me, you know what you're looking at, don't you? And it was exactly what I had said. But now he knows it more clearly because the Lord showed it to him in the dream. I pray that you will have a personal revelation of all of what has been said today so that you can make it your own in your thoughts in the mighty name of Jesus. Lastly, I want to give you an opportunity if you are here today or watching online and you say that Brother Moses, thank God for your obedience, for your service, for coming out to speak the mind of your father, the father of our Lord Jesus and now. I have heard what has been said, and I want to turn a new leaf. I want today to mark the beginning of the rest of my life. I want to stand before the Lord today to say that going forward, not my will, but yours be done. I stand before the Lord today to say that I'm ready to deny every idol that has occupied my psyche, my thinking. I am ready to renounce them to confess Jesus as the Lord. To confess that the word of God will be my God. If you are watching online, don't keep seeing where you stand out. I encourage you to stand up as, 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 as a demonstration of your response to this heavenly call. 
And for those of us who are here, who want to come and say, today I turn a new leaf. Today is not about my old religious ways and everything that everybody says, but it's now the personal revelation upon which Jesus builds his ecclesia. I want to I want to hold hands with you and praise and give God thanks for your decision to start afresh. So if you are one of such people present here, come forward. If you're watching online, just stand where you might be. If you can put your hand on your device, you go ahead. Just do something to help your thinking be properly aligned with the actions that is required this moment, which is submission and surrender. I surrender all. I surrender unto Jesus. Unto you, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. I surrender all. Tell him that you surrender everything. I surrender all. Hallelujah. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you for these ones that are present here today, boldly declaring that it's a new day, it's a new beginning. Father, in Jesus' name, Isabella, can you please come and just stay where you are? That's good. Lord, in Jesus' name, I thank you for this woman here. I thank you for where you're bringing her from. If you can just turn and face me here. It is indeed the beginning of the rest of your life. Your thoughts will be in submission to the thoughts of your heavenly Father. And he will bring you in through his thoughts and you will see his mind that you may declare to your generation the light of God's love in the mighty name of Jesus. I welcome you into this new season and I receive you unto the Lord as a beneficiary of the new dispensation that the Lord himself is creating in his love. In Jesus' name. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for this woman and the life that is present in her, that is of you. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, from here onward, you will hear clearly, you will see clearly, because the Lord is with you and you are with you. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you. I receive this woman onto this new leaf that she has turned to put her on the same page as the Lord Jesus. In her thinking, in her obedience, and in her submission. Everywhere that you have found it difficult to love, it can be easy now for you to love. Everyone that you have tried to accommodate and to receive into your heart that you have struggled to, now you will find room for them because the Lord comes in and he makes room within you for you have made room for him. In the mighty name of Jesus, God bless you. Hallelujah. Thank you all for, uh, praise the Lord, hallelujah. Thank you all for making it a date with the Lord yet again today. I know that there are needs that we have, but I have spoken to you today of the need that the Lord has, the need for your attention. Do not deny him and you will not be denied in any way. As Alan comes forth to receive the offerings, and for those people bringing their tithes or bringing whatever they have set aside in their hearts unto the Lord as you proposed in your heart, I want you to also continue to pray for us in your heart, you know, because a great door of opportunity has opened up to us. Hallelujah. Yes, praise the Lord. God is good. But you know what the Bible says? When the Bible talks about a great door, the apostle also says, but yet there are adversaries. And so as you thank God for the door, also thank God for victory over all of the opposition that is keeping us out. God bless you. It's a new day, communion house. God bless you in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. God is good. God is good. Let's prepare for our offerings. What a mighty delivery tonight. The word of God coming forth strong. Hallelujah.
to all of our first time guests. We welcome you. Thank you so much for coming. We're so thankful to have you here for a night like this. As we've been encouraged tonight, as we have been poured out into, let us pour into this house and our giving. Amen. You'll see the giving details there on the screen. If you need an envelope, our brother Kenyatta has it here. To our family online, even those of us that are here, if you're giving online, you'll see chameleon.house slash give, cash out dollar sign chameleon house, as well as PayPal at chameleon house. We'll give a few moments to prepare that, and we will pray. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for this night. How you have ordered our footsteps, O oh God, and have reminded us of your thoughts towards us, O oh God, of your word that we indeed are new creations that you have made available to us the mind of Christ. What we say unto you that we don't take lightly this opportunity of refreshing, this time of refreshing, even as it has been declared over us that this is a new day. Lord, we declare that this is the day that you have made and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. For you alone have opened this door unto us Oh God, and we shall run through it by your help, by your comforter, that is the Holy Ghost, oh God, by your angels that you have assigned to us. Lord, as we prepare these offerings, as we give them unto you, our tithe, the tenth part, let them be found pleasing unto you. We call forth every instruction that you have given us, oh God, and we declare by our feet that we shall be light unto them especially in this area of giving, O oh God, and to this ministry that you have blessed us with to be a part of, O oh God, by your leading, by your doing and your doing alone. We thank you that it be sweet smelling unto you. We declare that all glory and honor and power and might belong to you. And we all said, amen. Hallelujah. Let's celebrate the Lord. God is good. Yes, sir. Now, if you need an envelope, see, I, I think you just handed out one. If you need an envelope, please see our dear brother Kenyatta. He'll visit you with one. Amen. God is good. Now, I want to, as we wrap up, I want us to look at one slide here. Our dear brother Gavin will help us with a volunteer slide. The Lord has been moving mightily in our midst. We give God praise as he has just been growing us and and has just been showing his mercy and love towards us. And so I just want to remind us of the opportunity to volunteer here. You see, especially in the area of photography and children's help, um, as well as vocalists, set up, clean up, come see me. If the Lord has placed that on your heart, um, to just be a part of that, to pour into this house in a different way, to just uh, uh, really put your hand to the plow, let me know. Let's get you involved and let's see what the Lord is saying there. And we give God praise, all right? I look forward to next week, okay? We have been praying every Wednesday, 9 p.m. To those of us that are here for the first time, we do that on Instagram. I can share those details with you there. Um, the Lord has just been moving mightily there. You see, the Lord has, has been helping us in our seeing and has been revealing things to us individually for the edification of the body, knowing that the word declares that we prophesy in part. And so it's just really been a time of encouragement. So for those of us that have been joining or have been pressing in, praise God for you. If you have not yet, join us. Come see what the Lord is doing in that time of meeting. Amen? All righty. God is good. Everyone have a blessed night.